Welcome to the Ken McElroy Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. Good topic today. Today we're going to be discussing the end of the hedge fund control of America's <laughs> Act of 2023. And if this bill passes, it could change the housing market forever. And I am with my co-host, Joey. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Christmas present. So everyone uh, bear with me with that. So um, anyways, do you want to go over what this kind of bill states? Well, first of all, everyone's upset right now because, you know, Wall Street is basically buying houses. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been a sore topic for most people. And, and it really is interesting because if you think about it for the longest time, the, the, the residential real estate market specifically um, hasn't had to compete with Wall Street, hasn't had to compete with Blackstone or Black Rock. By the way, this is a golf community <laughs> in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It's not Black Rock. Um, Ken is not affiliated. I just have <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, but they're upset about it, and, and rightly so. I think you know it's um, uh, it's changed the residential market a lot because I mean, imagine just what if you're just trying to buy a house uh, near your parents, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you, you know some of these Wall Street groups are are of course buying the same house and they're competing against you all cash quick close so uh, people are upset first of all about this and and uh, you, you know there's there's all kinds of horror stories around this I, I mean there are some markets where 50 percent of the sales were to Wall Street right 50 percent right so you know that's obviously going to change the market a lot so so that's that's really you know kind of why this bill's been introduced um the 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 bad thing is that nobody thinks it's going to go anywhere it's a political hot potato it, it is because you know all of those people are invested in you know those bigger companies right and, and even bezos you know with amazon they just he just invested into a company to buy single family homes so i mean it's going to be hard, you know, for for it to really go anywhere when all the people voting on it are probably invested in well, those kind of it's things. That, yeah, that's for sure. But it, we're heading into an election year, so um, a lot of those, you know, call it Wall Street, um, you know, does oftentimes fund some of these political campaigns. Doesn't matter which side you're on. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting time to have this bill introduced basically one year before the election. Um, and uh, nobody thinks that it'll, it'll go anywhere. But essentially, it's going to require hedge funds to defined as corporation partnerships or real estate investment trusts that manage pools of investors to sell off all the single family homes they own for a 10 year period and eventually prohibit such companies from owning any at all. So I would imagine that, uh, uh, first of all, this is a great topic and I'm glad it was introduced because uh, we, d we do need some stability in the market. Well, it's interesting, you know, because a lot of people have been talking about this, like Rogan uh, was chatting about it on his show, Kevin O'Leary. And uh, Rogan was like, you know, they're going to find ways around this. I know. They find ways around everything, which, you know, is probably true. But, you know, Kevin O'Leary was saying, you know, in a market where there's already a shortage of rentals and a shortage of people that can buy them to mess with the rental market and make it less of an incentive for investors, because they look at investors as kind of like the bad guy, right? Like, oh, you know, you're going to own all these houses, so people have to rent from you. But the other option is these people owning the houses and they may not be be in a position to even do that so then they have nowhere to live yeah it, 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 the thing is is they're not buying them to move into them I, I, that's a disruption right. you know so think about typically the single family market i know we're a real estate investment channel here and a lot of people buy single family for rental and there's nothing wrong with that uh, certainly but this is very different I, I think the last number i looked at they owned something about 574,000 homes so far, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of homes. You know, that's well over, obviously, uh, half a million going on to 600,000. At some point, it will probably be there. I looked at the other day, uh, they're starting to do neighborhoods. There, You know, there's this new build to rent. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of people are doing the build to rents, BTRs they call them, and so you you know you, in, you, instead of buying houses and selling them off, they're buying them, building them out, and renting them. So they, you know they're they're getting into this game. It it it's very highly probable that this is just the tip of the iceberg. 
It's interesting though, because so, so you really do feel like there is a problem with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It, you know, it's here. It started actually, if you go back in 2008, I was involved in all that, you know, the market crash. And a lot of people don't maybe remember this as 15, 16 years ago, let's say. A whole bunch of homes went back to the bank. Mm -hmm. And so, so some smart Wall Street guys just started pulling cash together uh, in managed funds. And they started buying these toxic assets off of the bank's balance sheets, right? So that's how it started. And it was a cluster at that time because they didn't know. I mean, imagine, you know, buying a thousand homes from from, you know, from a bank and all of a sudden they were all over the place. They were in all kinds of different repair. Um, some had tenants, some didn't have tenants, some need a lot of work, some weren't worth it, some were um, and they didn't know how to manage them. And, and so, you know, you started to see this. Um, you know, this new industry emerge on the management side. And, and I know um, a good friend of mine uh, went to a, uh, a single family conference, single family conference in Arizona about a month ago. You remember we had dinner with him afterwards mm -hmm. and he said, I've been going to this conference for 12 years and it's usually kind of a mom and pop conference, which is fine. And that's what the industry has largely been. And of course we have the Airbnb issue as well, mm -hmm. which is another Another issue, also taking homes out out of the um, you know call it the you know the ownership pool, right? And um, so yeah, but, but he said this last year, um, fifty to sixty percent of the the folks there were all were all Wall Street. So it's moved from Main Street to Wall Street. Um, it's 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 pretty. Um, it, it's a pretty compelling. And to clarify, this isn't multifamily. This isn't apartments. This is single family homes Correct. specifically. Yeah. But multifamily, you guys, as you know, that's what I do. The Wall Street's been involved in that for a long time. You know, well, you, you have to have Wall Street involved in that. Yeah. Well, you don't have to. But, you know, for us, we haven't had Wall Street a lot in our deals. I've mm -hmm. done deals with them. But at the end of the day, you do have a choice. Most of the most of the multifamily guys are in trouble right now. It's their Wall Street. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is the Wall Street, Wall Street wants their money back within a certain period of time. That's the interesting thing about this strategy. You, you know, the reason why we don't do a lot of deals with some of these big institutions is quite simply because the way that they want, they want their money back in, in, in like three to four years, which makes sense. It's managed money and you make money, um, by, by coming in and, and selling. So, you know, it's a churn and that's essentially how it works. So, so it's going to be interesting to see at some point, there's going to be a number of listings. They're going to come in and snap these up, probably driving prices up. And then, um, they're going to have to exit too. There has to be an exit side of this as well. Right. So I don't know if this bill is the right thing, but it's certainly bringing a lot of attention to this industry. Well, we have a lot of comments on YouTube that I do want to get to. Um, you know, Eli is saying, you know, don't pensions and other retirement plans own shares of BlackRock? Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. So yeah. it gets a little more complicated than, you know, the landlord's the bad guy or these com big companies are the bad guy and the little guy needs to buy houses. Well, yeah. It, I mean, you know, there's a number of funds at BlackRock and they're in the trillions now. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to minimize what it is that they do, but essentially they manage your money. Like they manage people's money that, um, that and they might not even know. Right. Um, you know, so you're right. It's, you know, these are, this, these are pooled funds and, uh, that's all this is. And Lyle makes a good point too. He says, I'm, I'm for keeping hedge funds and corporations like BlackRock out of the housing market, but it's a slippery slope. How will we define who can and can't invest in uh, housing and who is drawing that line? I know it's a, it's a fair point. And right. I think that's, what's going to be up for debate that it's certainly disrupting the single family housing market right now. Let, let's just take a look at the two, the two big elephants in the room are this, these hedge funds, these big managed pools of fund, these these big funds like BlackRock, let's say, we'll just keep picking on them for for today. Um, but also the Airbnb market, you know, which isn't necessarily institutional. Mm -hmm. But you take a look at a market that was traditionally um, 
um, for for moving in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you right. Know, like, right. You're living. Yeah, in. you yeah. typically like typically these were the, the when the market was its most stable was when the majority of the homes that were bought and sold were for people that were actually going to move into them. Right. Okay. And then and then there's always been a rental component of that, but it's been small. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is it's it's just gotten quite quite bigger, and so therefore. You know, um, it's in in my opinion that's part of the reason that's driven up pricing. If if Wall Street wasn't as involved, we wouldn't have some of these pricing problems. R housing costs, right? Housing costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, to the point too, if if this bill were to pass, and uh, they did have to sell all their properties in the next ten years, yeah. that would lower the housing market costs, right? Yeah. The thing is, is you, you know, like no. You know, BlackRock's not going to hold a house for 10 years, first of all. Mm -hmm. So it already has an um, entry and an exit plan, uh, I'm sure, for the fund. The fund, the fund by definition, um, has things coming in and going out. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's how you generate these higher returns. You're basically buying low, selling high, generating fees. Um, sorry, generating the spread. And then the you know, and then everybody has their hand out in, in, in the middle, you know, because to to that uh, person's point earlier for you that that had mentioned on YouTube, um, you know, think about let's say you work uh, like my dad was a he was in a in a sheet metal union up in the Northwest, so he his sheet metal company he matches and puts into his his pension, and then there's somebody that manages that pension, so they get a fee. So there's fees at the local level. And then if that pension invests into BlackRock, there's another fee there, right? And then if BlackRock invests into a, a track of single family housing, there's more fees there. So, so essentially it's, um, you know, there's a lot of people in the chain making money uh, all the way up and down. You know, when it starts at, you know, somebody like my father who, you know, uh, was, a, was a union guy up in the Seattle area. And Florine said that they're seeing a lot of uh, build to rent in Jacksonville, Florida, where she's at. But she she has a good question. How would this proposal affect mom and pop landlords? So do you think corporations being involved in the housing market are making rents go up? Or was it like when we talked to our friends last night that are saying they're seeing some softening in their single family home prices? Do you think that's partially because of there's so much availability? Sure. Uh, I think it's a good question. You, you know, real estate is a very local thing, first of all. So I'm um, not exactly sure what's going on in that particular market. But if there's a shortage of single family homes in an area and you have Wall Street coming in and buying a lot of them, then you're going to have pricing issues with, with regard to the house price, with regards to the rent. Uh, it's essentially a scarcity or a supply problem, right? So if there's more demand in a, in a market, it's going to certainly uh, more demand uh, on on the to to buy. Uh, it's going to certainly drive prices up. It can work quite the opposite too, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it's going to depend on what's actually happening in that particular sub market, and um, so the the way to really dry, dive into it is to is to look at where they're buying and how aggressive they are. And um, cuz again, it's just a, it's just more buyers. That's all it is. More buyers in, with the with the limited pool will drive prices up. Right. And that and Chris had said with companies like BlackRock buying low and selling high, it's kicking the average person from being able to afford to buy. Yeah. But then Lyle said, you know, if this was able to pass and play out as intended, and it only prohibited large corporations, that could help first-time home buyers, families, and small-time investors. Yeah, yeah, and there's also something else out there that I read that you know Biden's also got something uh, in cooking as well that that he's trying to um, he's trying to make five hundred thousand homes affordable over the next ten years at the same time. So I thought it was interesting timing because it's also a ten year horizon. Well, and then in separate legislation going along with that, um, Jeff Jackson and Alma Adams of North Carolina are introducing the American Neighborhoods Protection Act on Wednesday, and that and it's interesting timing that all this is kind of happening at the same time. To your point, election year, um, but also you know housing shortage, affordability issues. But you know, so basically, what this act says, it would require corporate owners and 
and owners that own more than 75 single family homes to pay an annual fee of $10,000 per home into a housing trust fund to be used as a down payment assistance for families. And for those of you that own single family homes, uh, paying, you know, almost $1,000 a month to the government straight off the top, they don't want you to own more than 75 <laughs> single family homes is essentially what they're saying. Because, you know, if you're having to do that per home, it's not going to make sense. Yeah. So they'll be I, I think this is a great hot topic today. It's something to watch. Um, I personally come kind of on in the I heard, I heard Rogan talking about it, too. I, I kind of in his court, I think that um, at the end of the day, well, Wall Street's probably going to be here and uh, they're probably going to be in the space. You know, mm -hmm. that would be my guess. You don't think that this is going to pass on any kind of level? I don't. And there's going to be all kinds of, of temps at this and you know, because people are going to start blaming Wall Street for affordability problems. Right. Essentially. Right. And and uh, if it's marketed correctly, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're, they're uh, it, it, you know, they're going to come after them. Right. And I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how the individual administrations handle this, because affordability, whether it's um, a rent or um, a home right now, you know, is 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 really out of reach for for a lot of folks it is but then at the same time you know we need housing for people badly so then the more you know in in our experience the more stipulations they put around housing and what you can use housing for and how you can make money on housing and the the, the fines that you're going to charge it just ma if it makes it unappealing then there's no reason to build it well, that's the situation we're in now. As you as you guys know, you, you cannot build affordable housing today. Right. Period. Because the land costs, the zoning, uh, what zoning is, it me means they restrict the number of units you can put on a piece of land. And then there's the impact fees, which are, let's think of it as um, if there's a vacant piece of land, the costs to be able to plug in to sewer, to water, to electric. Um, there's there's property tax scenarios and there, there's all kinds of things that drive the cost up of a, of a property before you even actually put the shovel in the dirt. So, um, you know, all of those things um, are costs to that development. And so you have all those. Then in addition to that, you have the cost of the actual home itself, which is expensive. And then in addition to that, you have interest rates and it, a new construction right now, you know, because we're building, we, we're looking at eight, nine percent construction debt. So that's the interest rate for construction. Because think about it. Construction interest rates should be more expensive because they're higher risk. Mm -hmm. You know, they're giving you something. Um, they're, they're giving you a, a loan on something that doesn't exist. And so they're, the risk of you delivering it on time, having no problems with the contractors, being able to deliver it on budget, all those things are higher. So construction debt is typically higher. The other thing is it's also non or it's also recourse. So recourse means that um, it's personally guaranteed. So you have all of those things that are potential issues for new construction. And so the, the real focus here, as I said in my video last week, it's a supply problem. Right. You know, if you, you know, I did this video on Friday, I think it was on YouTube that quite frankly just shows the population continues to grow at a steady pace. And, you know, we're talking about people that are born, people that die, and then um, plus immigration. I'm not going to get into the immigration issue, but the point is um, all of that math works out to a steady rise in population growth. Now, yes, it's spotty. It's all over the place. Some, you know, you, you can you can make an argument for where they are, or where they're not. But the point is. You, when you have new people coming into anything, it puts pressure on the existing housing stock. Mm -hmm. And if you look at housing starts, really, uh, for over the last 15 years, it, we're way behind. Even though right now you're going to see in the news that, um, and it's true, we have a, a fair amount of new supply hitting the market in 2024. It's going to burn off in 2025, and then it drops right off a cliff. So, you know, late, call it uh, summer of 2025, 
tell through 2026, even 2027, guys, we're going to have another shortage. I'm telling you right now. Do you think that um, the government is a part of this? Is they're trying to push people into multifamily because it's more well? I don't know. Sustainable it's, and economic. Well, and it's it's been fun to watch the different presidents and how they address the homeowner, the American dream. Let's call it right. Mm-hmm. So if you go back, well, since I've been in the business, you, you know, uh, actually Bush, uh, George W had a whole whole uh, plan called the American dream he wanted every, he, he believed everybody should own a home okay well that's what created the 08 oh you're gonna get people mad it wasn't Obama that no. created 08 no, I'm <laughs> telling you guys like Obama Obama he you know he got the heat from the administration before just go look you'll see um, you know and so um, now I'm not saying it, it wasn't going on at the beginning of his administration but if you take a look during 08 he was sitting in office of course but there's lag on all this stuff so that all created you know this big falling out and um, and then of course home ownership went way down again as mm-hmm. people moved from homeowners home from homeowners into, uh, into the rental market um, and and um, and so each administration has kind of handle it a little bit differently right and right. um so you know biden's new plan is to start uh offering some affordability um you know but that's very uh, similar to george w's we're trying to get people into a home it that is. might not be able to necessarily it is afford it. it is yeah it is it's uh but let, let, let me tell you the number one way the only way to fix affordability is to build a bunch of stuff flood the market with with new housing um and and let and the market will solve itself it be if you, if there's a lot to choose from then um prices will go down yeah <laughs> that's the bottom line well and i want to read this comment from joel because it's interesting and not not trying to get into the immigration thing but he said if the white house reporters say three hundred thousand people cross the border in december alone you figure that's four to a household that's seventy five thousand houses yeah. a month every month whether that's multifamily, you know apartments or houses Correct. or whatever and are we building seventy five thousand a month? And that's that's the question. And that's actually a very fair and yep. good point. If it's yeah, yeah, there's, if those are the right numbers, a, but even yeah. if it's half that, you know, right? I mean, you guys know I, you know, we live on the border of uh, of Mexico. Um, you know, um, we have a property in Sierra Vista that I built uh, ten years ago, brand new, beautiful project. And Sierra Vista is very close. Sierra to Sierra Vista is just very near the border. In fact, the Border Patrol is based there, and we actually rent a lot of units to them. So I'm very familiar with. You know, I know Texas is um, kind of getting a lot of headlines today around uh, immigration, and Arizona's had its fair amount, but. Um, you know, it's a real thing when, when you know, um, you know, that when, when there's a it's there's always been a steady flow, believe it or not, of of people coming through legally and illegally always. And um, there's all kinds of po- politics around it. But the bottom line is he's right. There's those folks do need housing somewhere and typically starts off in rentals, typically. And uh, but one thing that I do know is that they also um, oftentimes will group together. So it's not a typical family of four. They might have, you know, a fair amount of people living under one roof um, and, um, you know, sharing the expense for the rent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So but to to hear to your point, once they get on their feet, they start making money. And um, if it stays in the U.S. at all, because uh, there's that's in a whole nother battle. Sometimes that that money gets wired back to. Mexico uh, doesn't even stay in the U.S. But the the point is, is um, we have a that's just immigration. We have a housing issue. Um, we always have had, and and I think that um, the you know if you if you look at uh, from about early two thousands, we had a pretty balanced market. Rents were only going up one two three percent. Home 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 prices were not spiking. Um, and so as popula- as we have population growth, no matter where it's coming from, um, there has to be housing to match it, mm-hmm. period. Now, I know, you know this isn't a perfect science. So, you know, if a bunch of people move into Phoenix, um, let's say for some reason, then prices are going to go up. 
you know, and then therefore Phoenix specifically needs more housing. And um, but if a bunch of people move out, like uh, is happening in some of these some of these other cities, you, you guys like, like we're seeing high vacancies in some markets as a result of safety or defunding police or whatever it is, um, you know, that people are moving around or work from home is probably the big one right now. So that's all changing um, everything. And I, that's actually I love I love it because if you're paying attention, there's massive, massive opportunities. I was I was at the gym this morning talking to a guy that bought just outside of Kansas City, bought a duplex for 175, and the rents he said were about 700 per side, um, and uh, so he bought it for under 100 grand per unit, and um, and he said um, uh, at the first of the year we raised them to 1200 because they were that far under market. So I'm like, man, that cash flows like crazy. He's like, yeah, there's deals, and the, the reason why that is is um, there that that particular market where he's in. Um, it ended up, um, um, you know, it ended up having a lot of people move there, right? Mm -hmm. So, so now there's not as much vacancy as there was, and the landlord there hadn't caught, kept up. So, you know, first there was vacancy, now there's not. Um, so he went in and bought at the right time, and was able is is able to catch the rent growth. So those are the 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 market inefficiencies. In my opinion, is the the whole reason I love this business. Is, is as people move around, um, you know, it creates these these shortages and, and these sub supply and demand problems. Yeah, and so this bill, you know, if passed, we're not sure it's going to pass. We don't feel like it is right now, but it is turning into a conversation, which is interesting. Um, but we want to jump into our Ken McElroy Pro questions. Um, in order to join Ken McElroy Pro, just go to KenMcElroy.com forward slash join dash now. Um, and we try to answer all of your questions. So David from uh, Ken McElroy Pro said, in a recent YouTube video, you showed three properties you recently exited, and one was in Tulsa. You yeah. mentioned you were exiting Oklahoma. May I ask why? Does this mean is there something about Oklahoma you don't like for investing? I'm considering looking there. Yeah, it's a great question. So we bought in both Oklahoma City and in Tulsa, Gosh, over 10 some years ago, maybe 15. And uh, we owned a number of properties there. And um, so, you know, as, as I started to grow my own business and, and invest in other markets, you know, we st I started in Phoenix. I started just like a lot of you, you know, I started with one two bedroom, you know, two bath and used my own money. And then I started raising money and started doing it. And then at some point you're, you kind of outgrown your market. Then I went to Tucson and then I went to Flagstaff and then I went to Prescott, which is all in Arizona. Then we went to Dallas and then we started going to, uh, all around Texas. And, and then we went to Oklahoma. And so, so now over all that period of time, I've been able to take a look at which markets are growing at what rates, because I'm in them all. So it's been fun to watch is, okay, how's Tucson doing compared to Phoenix or Flagstaff or, or Mesa or Chandler or, or Dallas or San Antonio or Austin or Houston or, you know, or Oklahoma City or, or Tulsa. And so, so all of those markets have different fundamentals and different dynamics going on. They got people moving in, people moving out. They got employers moving in. They got employers moving out. They got different uh, politicians, you know, coming in and out and different things going on. And so what happened for us is about five years ago, we started to recognize that Oklahoma, while it was fine and, and steadily growing, it was not growing at the rate of, let's say, Dallas, as an example, or Phoenix or Tucson. And so, so as you guys start to look at your investments, globally or i guess not globally but from the u.s standpoint those are things you pay attention to you know how's this property done for five years as compared to my others with the same investment you know and so that's all that happened in tulsa it's not that i dislike the market it's just that we said okay let's move this money to another market that might be going um, um, a little, little faster. That's all. So, uh, in in the in the Oklahoma City deals, you know, we, we ended up moving that money into Dallas, and Dallas has outpaced Oklahoma City. Um, and uh, this represented our last deal. In uh, it was in a, a little town called Broken Arrow, beautiful little town, um, uh, the preferred area of Tulsa, in my opinion. And uh, we we liked it, but I owned it for 15 years. 
I refinanced it like three times or something. I was, I renovated it at least two, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, you know, we're, we're, um, uh, you know, we, we decided cause we only had one asset left in Oklahoma to, you know, to move that money into another market. So, so the next question comes from Jordan from Ken McElroy pro. What are your thoughts on me having partners? I do most of the work and have the people and management in place, but I don't have the funds to do all the deals. Should I just wait and let the deals go by or try and take someone in? I just find it hard because someone always outworks the other. Yeah, that's a really, really insightful question. First of all, my suggestion is that you don't bring on a partner. Um, you partner in a deal. So in other words, you keep your partnership the way it is. You handle all the management, all those kinds of things, especially if they're not going to add anything. And then you don't have to. So I ran into this problem myself years ago when I was in my 30s. I did exactly this. I partnered with some guy, um, I won't say who, um, out of Pennsylvania, and and it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a big group that uh, promised to fund my real estate deals, and they didn't. <laughs> and then eventually, at some point, I ended up. They ended up um, paying me a bunch of money to, you know, for me to. Um, um, uh, take take over their you know to 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 leave basically so um what happened was uh so then from there i just said you know i i can do all the operations piece and i can find the deals and that kind of stuff and money is money man like you know and and people them you know what what goes on with funds or institutions or partners uh, sometimes they're liquid and sometimes they're not and so the way we do it is we go find the asset and we have our only our own stuff, our own management company, our own development company, our own construction company, whatever it is. And then we go find the equity for that one asset. And uh, we bring them in for that one asset. And if they don't fund, um, then you just go to the next person. But if they do fund, uh, also the other thing that it does for you is it, 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 it kind of levels the playing field if you have several options for, for money then um, you'll know kind of what the price price of that money is. Plus, he also said, I find it hard because someone always outworks the other. Well, the person providing the money, that's kind of their... That's their role. That's their role. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. Um, you know, they're going to... They're going to invest in the deal, obviously, first, and then you second. Um, so, um, y you know, I, I hate to say it, but management companies are kind of a dime a dozen. Right. You know, you can find management people, you can find people to rent your properties and they're, they're, they're everywhere. Not good ones. That's a whole different topic, but, um, you know, the, it's easy to replace that. And, um, I'm not saying, but it, what's not easy is to find deals, um, and put the whole, the whole team together. But that's what I would do if I were you. And then, um, hopefully, I mean, I know, I know people that have started this way and they, they've got a great investor that funds all everything that they do yeah we've uh, met a couple of people a like lot that, of yeah. folks do that and and so that would be obviously ideal uh, but then it's deal by deal by deal your your equity partner um, isn't committed um, they ha they look at the deal so so you, you now you're not getting into an argument with them about they should they got a fund because maybe they don't think it's a great deal maybe you do so it's just you know the market the equity markets are fair because um, everyone's looking for good real estate deals. Um, as long as you can deliver them, um, my experience has been that the people step up. Our next question comes from Chad from Ken McRae Pro. He said, in regards to billboards, what zoning, regulatory, and other considerations need to be thought of? Can I just buy a piece of land and put one up? I have a feeling it's not that easy. Yeah, no, no. Well, okay, so... There's a tr there's a fair amount of um, ways to, to do billboards. So um, you can buy a property with a billboard on it. I've done that. Um, or you can buy a property and 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 um, and then go. You have to get a lease for the um, if you don't own the property. Let's say yeah, you, you can get a lease from somebody else. So a lot of times really well-placed billboards are along like um, highways, let's say. Well, you're probably going to have to get a lease with the state, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a process there. You have to hire an attorney. There's a whole there's a whole bunch of stuff surrounding how high it can be, whether it can be illuminated or not. You know, the, the two sides called static and then the digitals are obviously require power. So there's that. Um, and then um, they, they, there's certain setbacks and there's a whole bunch of stuff. So it's um, there's there's a bit to it. But land leases are a real thing. So, you know, there I, I got a friend that that's doing them with solar farms. So solar farms in Arizona are a big deal. So you go out and find, you know, thousands of acres and you you, you put in solar farms, you know, that generate power. Those are leases. You're not actually buying the land from the farmer. So same thing along a freeway or, or a highway or something like that. So there's a fair, it's just each, each town has, and each city, state, and county have different regulations. Um, you know, and I know this just from our own um, advertising our apartments or whatever it is that you might be. There are sign regulations and there are restrictions. There are some areas like Scottsdale, Arizona, for example, which is where I live. There's only two billboards in the whole city. That's it. And they don't want them. So, you know, um, now that's not the same as in Phoenix as, as an example. So, uh, and those, those, both of those are older ones and they're in old town or come South Scottsdale and uh, there's no way they'll ever let those convert be converted to digital, as an example, right? Because they're along the Scottsdale Road corridor. So, so anyway, the, it just all depends. But you can't just go stick one up in the middle of a field somewhere. Uh, but it's a good question. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening today. Make sure I have a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. So make sure you go to KenMacQuarry.com forward slash webinar. Check that out. It's going to be at 4 p.m. January 24th. And we'll see you all next week. See you guys.